It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Deputy Premier. Right now, there is 35,000 long-term care beds that do not meet provincial standards. Ontario seniors deserve the highest standard of safety, security and dignity. These beds don't meet that. That's more than half of the province's long-term care beds that don't meet standards. Yet the Liberal government has cut $54 million from the health care budget this year alone. The government continues to erode the fragile state of health care in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, why does this government care so little for Ontario's most frail and vulnerable? Mr. Speaker, why are seniors allowed to live in conditions deemed unfit by their very own government? Well, uh, thank you, Speaker, and um, I just need to clarify before I hand to the uh, and supplementary Deputy to the House uh, associate minister responsible for uh, uh, long-term care, Speaker. I need to uh, make it very clear that the health care budget has not been cut, and any suggestion that the health care budget has been cut is absolutely erroneous. It is. Order. Finish, please. Uh, speaker, it increased uh, last year, this year, and will continue to increase. Unlike the transfers from the federal government related to health care, that the member opposite stood and applauded in his uh, when he was an MP. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, the Deputy Premier, Ontario's senior population is expected to double to over 4.5 million by 2041. Yet the response of this government is to cut $50 million from physiotherapy, seeing falls to rise dramatically. We've seen home care cut to Ontario seniors. Nursing jobs have been slashed across the province. Entire hospital wings have been closed. There are already 800,000 Ontarians without a family doctor, and yet the government is callously cutting 50 medical residency positions. Mr. Speaker, when will this Order. government ensure that seniors get proper health care in Ontario? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, nothing could be further from the truth. This, as the Deputy Premier just mentioned, the health care budget in this province for years has increased. It's increasing this year. It's increasing next year, the year after that, the year after that. We're making, within that budget, we're making important decisions to continue to improve the quality of care of patients across this province. We've made a significant investment last year to respect and recognize the valuable role that our personal support workers play in the province, where almost $100 million of additional funds are going to improve their standard of living yep. and recognize the important role that yep. they play. The changes that we made to physiotherapy resulting in 200,000 more seniors receiving physiotherapy services, let alone, as I mentioned, today, an extension of public physiotherapy across the province. Mr. Speaker, we continue to make these improvements. I think he's Thank reflecting you. on the Conservative government's record for that. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Deputy Premier. This fall, Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Member Hospital. Member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, come to order. Mr. Speaker, this fall, Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital will be closing one of their operating rooms. The hospital will have seven fewer beds in complex continuing care. Sadly, they will be forced to close the geriatric day unit. The nursing cuts will sure to follow all because the government will not fund $5 million they need to keep the operating rooms and the beds working in Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, I'm not asking the government for more rehearsed lines or, or rehash photo ops. I'm asking a direct question, Mr. Speaker. Will they honour the $5 million critical shortfall at Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital? Thank you. Minister Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the member opposite, the leader of the uh, official opposition, should know that we've increased our funding to hospitals across this province by 50 percent, by some 11, from $11 billion a decade ago to $17 billion today. That's a substantial increase. 
and it's resulting in improved patient care throughout the province, including in Orillia, Mr. Speaker. And I know that uh, I know the comments of his predecessor and those who came before him with regards to our nurses. We're committed to our nurses in the province. We've added more than 24,000 more nurses, including 10,800 RNs in this province over the past decade. So we're committed to continuing to grow our health care system. Um, there's been some engaging of conversations between people that are sitting near the minister and those that are making comments uh, haphazardly. I'm asking for all of us just to listen to the question and answer. Please finish. The party opposite never even bothered to measure wait times for important surgical procedures in this province. Never. We began to measure those wait times. When we began to measure them, what we found, we inherited the worst wait times in Canada. Answer. We now have the best wait times, the shortest wait times in the entire country, Mr. Speaker. Please. The member from the PN Carleton will come to order. New question. The member from. Mr. To the uh, Deputy Premier. Ontarians are disgusted about huge bonuses awarded to sure. well paid Pan Am executives. Speaker, handing up to $450,000 to people already paid at least a quarter of a million dollars earns this government a gold medal in being out of touch. Especially when we see hospital services slashed, people struggling to find home care or long term care, and so many families unable to make ends meet. We don't even know what the games cost, but in world record time, this minister opens the vault to those who have already cashed in. Speaker, will the government do the right thing by issuing an immediate stop payment on these obscene bonus checks? The minister responsible for the Pan Am Para Pan Am. The minister responsible for the Pan Am. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, congratulate uh, the member opposite for uh, being the new critic for uh, tourism, culture, and sport. And um, I want to start by saying this, Mr. Speaker. I had a, an incredible summer out there across the province, meeting our athletes and uh, uh, getting into different communities. In fact, the best way you could have uh, met with a conservative this summer is to show up a, to a, a Pan Am game uh, in one of their communities because they were there uh, the whole time. But the story is very different here in the legislature. And from the very beginning. Beginning, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Conservatives have been attacking these games. They said we weren't going to be able to sell any tickets. We sold over a million tickets for the Pan Am Games. My former critic said no one's cheering for these games, but Mr. Speaker, 1.4 million people attended our celebrations throughout the province. Mr. Speaker, more than 31 million Canadians tuned in either through the television or radio for the Pan Am Care Pan Am Games. Member from Leeds Grenville, supplementary. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Back to the Deputy Premier. But I, I have to say, Minister, uh, don't put the athletes and the attendees. We're talking about yeah, your yeah. mismanagement yeah. of the operation. Yeah. Speaker, the Minister and the Premier can't even get their story straight. The Minister says the games were under budget, but the Premier admits they don't know yet. Look, the truth is these games only posted the $50 million savings that the claimed by the minister because of a $74 million bailout from taxpayers. By my math, that's a $24, $24 million deficit, another reason why these bonuses aren't deserved. Speaker, in the interest of open and transparent government, Will the government support my request, request to bring in the Auditor General and put these bonuses on the bench until we get the real costs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, first, uh, first point, the $56 million that we reported as a surplus for infrastructure was reported. The member for Renfrew will come to order, and I'm tempted to move right into the warnings, but I'll give you a chance. The $6 million surplus in infrastructure was reported months and months ago at our technical briefings that these guys didn't show up to actually get the information. In addition to that, Mr. Speaker, 
the member opposite knows that the compensation package and the, the bylaws and the rules and regulations around TO 2015 was a three-government uh, three uh, process, and in fact, the leader of the opposition, his government was part of that process. Oh. So I don't understand why it was good enough for the leader of the opposition before when he was in, when he was in Ottawa, but why is it bad now? Final supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. Public elementary school teachers are still without a contract. There are 800,000 Ontarians without a family doctor, and you're currently clawing back doctors from seeing new patients. Wait times for long-term care have tripled since 2005, and this government slashed $54 million from the health care budget. All of that, and the Premier is giving Pan Am executives a bonus. Mr. Speaker, does the government have no shame or just the wrong priority? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to uh, I want to talk a little bit about the compensation uh, structure again. It was developed on the advice of a third-party uh, consulting uh, firm that was brought in, and it's based on uh, it's based on attracting the right type of people over a short period of time to really deliver. Uh, Carry on, please. To really uh, to be able to deliver the type of games that would make Ontarians proud, this was a large budget, 2.5 billion dollar budget. Uh, the Ontario government uh, put in a substantial amount. The federal government put in a substantial amount. The municipal government put in a substantial amount. And really, we wanted to attract the best and brightest uh, from across this country to help us deliver the best type of games, and we were able to accomplish that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. The Premier is ploughing ahead with her scheme to sell off Hydro One. She's ignoring 83 per cent of Ontarians who want to stop this privatization scheme and keep our hydro in public hands. But rather than listening, Speaker, the Premier is doubling down on the biggest privatization in this province since Mike Harris. How can the Liberals defend the sell-off scheme when they have no mandate, Speaker, they have no public support and no evidence whatsoever to sell off Hydro One? Well, thank you, Speaker. And, uh I think the, the leader of the third party will recall that this actually was in our 2014 budget. This was in our uh, election platform, and, and it actually was in their platform as well, because they used our fiscal assumption, Speaker, to develop their plan. Looking at assets is the responsible thing for a government to do. We have a very uh, strong need to build the infrastructure for the future, Speaker, for today and for the future. That infra infrastructure must be paid for. We, we are, have looked at ways in which we can pay for that infrastructure, but make no mistake about it. We, the infrastructure is required, so I am just asking the leader of the third party exactly what infrastructure projects she is recommending that we not proceed with. Answer. Because the only choice is you build them and pay for them, or you don't build them at all. The uh, member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, come to order, please. Supplementary. Uh, Speaker, I can guarantee the Deputy Premier that this party, the New Democratic Party, is the, probably the only party in this legislature that would never privatize Hydro One. Not today, not tomorrow, never. But that party and that Premier and that Liberal government are, in fact, determined to sell off Hydro One. But to get away with it, Speaker, to get away with it, they need to keep Ontarians in the dark. And that's why the Premier stripped Hydro One of oversight. That's why she removed the ability of our public watchdogs to look into Hydro One and to look out for the people of Ontario. And that's why she refused to let Ontarians have their say in public hearings or in a referendum. How can this Liberal government defend the biggest rollback of accountability in the history Question. of our electricity system, Speaker. Well, Speaker, I'm, I'm happy to refresh the, member of, of the memory of the uh, leader of the third party. 
In their nine-page platform, the NDP borrowed our plan, including our plan to maximize the value of our assets. In an interview with News Talk 1010 Radio, the leader of the third party said, and I quote, on May the 7th, there is no doubt we did talk in our platform about looking at some of the physical assets the province owns. Speaker, during the campaign, they talked about looking at assets. After the campaign, when they take the, put their finger in the wind, Speaker, now they are opposed. We need to build this infrastructure. The people of the province are counting on us to build infrastructure. The shouting is going back and forth enough that I'm uh, asking for you to bring it down. Uh, final supplementary. Speaker, I've asked the Premier over and over to come clean with Ontarians about the sell-off of Hydro One, but the Premier stubbornly refuses to bring any openness, Speaker, any transparency, any accountability to her scheme. She's stripped Hydro One of oversight. She refuses to provide any evidence, to release any evidence to the public to back up her scheme. And she's plowing ahead with a sell-off that Ontarians, Ontarians overwhelmingly reject. Why does this acting premier believe that Ontarians should be kept in the dark about the single biggest privatization scheme in a generation? Uh, well, Speaker, when it comes to transparency, let me review the, uh, the record on that. You will recall, as I said earlier, this was included in our 2014 budget. It was included in our, our platform. It was included in their platform. The Advisory Council issued an, a, a, an uh, interim report and a final report, both publicly available. We've held a technical briefing, and the member from Kitchener-Waterloo attended that technical briefing. It, to further ensure transparency, we have brought in Denis Desautel, the former Auditor General of Canada, to oversee the IPO. The member knows full well that publicly traded companies are subject to different oversight mechanisms than Crown corporations. However, the new Hydro One will be regulated by the Ontario Business Corporations Act, the Ontario Securities Act, the Ontario Energy Board. Answer. We will have to file information with the Ontario Securities Commission, disclose the compensation of their top executive speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Questions uh, to the acting premier speaker. The premier and now the acting premier are desperately trying to justify their sell-off of Hydro One. The Premier wants us to believe that she had no choice but to privatize hydro, but she could not be more wrong, Speaker. The Liberals had better choices, smarter choices, and every opportunity to make them, but they failed to make the right choice for Ontarian Speaker. And now this Liberal government fears nothing more than public scrutiny of the Premier's bad decision. Will this acting premier explain to Ontarian Speaker why openness and transparency and accountability are the biggest threats to the premier's privatization scheme? Well, Speaker, we are investing in infrastructure because this province needs that investment. Make no mistake about it. We're committed, committed to making the largest investment in infrastructure in Ontario's history, $130 billion. Speaker, that's not just about roads and bridges and transit. That's about jobs. That's 110,000 jobs a year that we will be creating as a result of these investments. The leader of the third party needs to understand that not investing has consequences. There is a cost to not investing. So again, we're asking, what are you going to cancel? Regional Express Rail, over 10 years, weekly go rail trips will go from 1,500 to nearly 6,000 trips. On the Barrie Line, weekly trips from 700 to more than 200. Kitchener Line, Answer. weekly trips from 80 to more than 250. Lakeshore East Line. But maybe it's Hamilton. Maybe it's the Hamilton Line Thank you. that you want to. Uh... Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier has run out of excuses, and all those government members on the back benches are going to have a tough time defending the sale of Hydro One because the Premier could have made a better choice to build the transit and inf Finish, please. 
The Premier could have made a better choice to build the, uh, the, uh, the transit and infrastructure that our province needs, and every single one of those backbenchers knows it, Speaker. The Premier deliberately instead chose to hand Hydro One to the highest bidder, and they know that as well. She deliberately chose to sell off a public asset against the will of the majority of the people of Ontario, and they know that too. Friends, will the acting premier do the right thing and admit that openness, transparency, and accountability is the biggest Thank you. threat to this premier scheme? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, so, Speaker, what we are doing is creating new assets. We are creating those assets that are needed for today. Yes, it's true that 140 years ago, Sir Adam Beck from London, Ontario, had a vision. He saw what Ontario needed at that time in history, and they needed electricity, Speaker. The government of the day acted on that, built that electricity system. The government of today sees that we need to build infrastructure, Speaker, whether it's a connecting link. Member from Prince Edward Hastings. Carry on. Speaker, whether it's uh, Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph, whether it's 401, Highway 401 improvements in, uh, in London, 417 in Ottawa, Maley Drive in Sudbury, uh, the Highway from 17 between Thunder Bay and Nipigon. Speaker, Sir. all of these investments are needed. They are needed now. We are building them now, and we have to pay for them. And that's why we are taking assets that we have and investing in new assets. Thank you. That's it. I think final. Sorry about that. You're right. Final supplementary. This premier had better choices, Speaker, but she made the wrong decision for the people of Ontario. Her privatization scheme protects her small group of powerful friends from paying their fair share, but it leaves families and businesses paying the price for decades to come. Instead of asking the biggest corporations to pay just a little bit more to help tackle congestion and to build infrastructure, this Premier is plowing ahead with a massive privatization scheme. This Premier is following in the footsteps of Mike Harris. Now, we'll Will this acting premier finally admit that openness and transparency and accountability is actually the biggest threat to the premier's privatization scheme? Thank you. So, the speaker, the NDP are, are, I think, famous now for having one solution to every problem, no matter what the issue is. Their answer is increased taxes on corporations, speaker, and that is a refrain that the federal leader has joined in as well, speaker. We are taking a more sophisticated approach. We are taking a, a number of strategies to pay for this infrastructure. But let's go back to what we are actually investing in. The Stouffville line, the Milton line, the Richmond Hill line, Speaker, support for Smart Track, a billion dollars for Hamilton LRT. Uh, speaker, uh, we're doing an EA for high speed rail from Toronto to London. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, We've second got, time. We've got uh, investments for rural and northern natural gas gas expansion. That is a vital investment, Speaker. The Connecting Links Program. Communities across Answer. this province are asking for help on the Connecting Links Program, and we are responding to that. Speaker, these are important investments. These are wise investments, Thank you. and we're prepared to make the decisions to, to make Thank you. I uh, apologize to the Leader of the Third Party for losing track. Uh, new question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. Once again, uh, health care in my riding was put at risk by a second round of cuts made by this Liberal government. 158 wow. full-time frontline staff have been fired from the North Bay Regional There's Health Centre. More than half of them were nurses. This is on top of the 197 frontline health care workers already fired at the hospital. Again, more than half of those were nurses. Speaker, this is devastating for the community, the workers, and their patients who are now rightfully concerned about access to quality health care. Speaker, do the Liberals have any remorse Questions? whatsoever over squandering 
a billion dollars on the gas plant scandal, Thank money you. that could have been used. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to talk about North Bay Regional Hospital as well. The, uh, the new hospital that was built uh, and opened, uh, I think, four years ago uh, as a result of a capital investment uh, of this Liberal government. Mr. Speaker, when that hospital was built and when it amalgamated with a, with a site in Sudbury as well, uh, it was determined and found by the hospital as well as the Lynn that uh, it needed certain issues needed to be right sized, and in fact the efficiencies of the hospital were lower for certain programs and services, and the costs were higher than other hospitals in the north, similar hospitals in the north, or other hospitals around the province. So what's been underway for the last several years is to actually take account of the fact that the expenses Answer. and the lack of efficiency of the hospital needs to be addressed so the quality of care, which I can speak to in the supplementary, Thank you. is maintained, but the hospital is as efficient as it can be. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. Nothing he said gives any comfort to the people of North Bay. Speaker, in this new hospital, they just closed 60 beds in this brand new facility that he spoke of. They're not just cutting in my riding, Speaker. Hundreds of nurses and frontline health care services have been cut in hospitals right across Ontario. Leamington, Chatham, New Lisker, Timmins, Sudbury, the Sioux, Aurelia, Quinty, Scarborough. And just this week, we learned that frontline cuts in Ottawa led to higher readmission rates. The Auditor General warned the, this Liberal government's continued deficits will lead to the crowding out of important programs. Speaker, we now know exactly what the auditor was referring to. What is this Liberal government going Question. to do about the deteriorating health care services in North Bay? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, this is ironic coming from the party that ran on a platform of cutting 100,000 yeah. public sector, sector jobs in the Mr. Speaker, funding. Mr. Speaker. Order, please. We'll start the clock. Start the clock. I'm not amused. Please finish. Wrap up. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, funding funding for North Member from Nipissing, come to order. increased by over 100 million in 2003, an increase in funding of 128 percent, Mr. Speaker. We've also provided the hospital. Actually, that's your time, and the member from Nipissing, second time. New question, the member from Bramley Gormalton. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> My question is to the Deputy Premier. We learned this morning that the OPP have been trying to get and trying to find a court to lay charges in their month long, months long investigation into the alleged bribery of a Liberal candidate in the Sudbury by election. It seems, though, that this attempt to lay charges has been stalled. The OPP commissioner is quoted as saying that he is frustrated at the, the member from the Fian Carlton come to order to lay Deputy House charges, Leader, second but he's time. confident that his members uh, of the OPP have done an exceptional job. It seems that charges are imminent, that charges are, will be laid. What is this government doing to ensure that this investigation is installed further so that charges can be laid and so that Ontarians can learn the truth Question. of what happened in the bribery scandal? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And I must say that I'm very surprised to hear this question from the member opposite, who happens to be a lawyer who presumably knows how the system works and he knows that a system is very independent and arm's length from the government. Speaker, from day one, we have been absolutely clear that this investigation is arm's length from the government, is being done, undertaken by the proper authorities, and it will their processes that will determine uh, the entire investigation 
and the, the process. There is no engagement, there is no interference from the government, uh, and that is absolutely clear, uh, clear. So I am not sure, Speaker, what the member opposite is trying to ask, except for he's trying to interfere. He's seeking interference from a government in an arms length process, which is totally unacceptable, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure the government agrees that the OPP do phenomenal work in our communities, and they've done an exceptional job here. They seem to think that a case is made, that there's enough evidence to proceed to charges against a senior member of the Premier's office. The Liberal government has repeatedly promised that they will be an accountable and transparent government. The people of Ontario want and demand a transparent and accountable government. So when there's an allegation of bribery, something as serious as bribery, involving a senior official in the Premier's office, it raises some serious questions, and Ontarians deserve to have those answers. We are hopeful that a criminal investigation and now potential upcoming prim prim criminal prosecution will provide those answers. But we need assurances that the government will provide the necessary support and resources Question. to ensure that this investigation proceeds to a prosecution. Will this government commit to providing the support to this investigation? Thank you. Speaker, I've, I've never heard a question with that many ifs and mays and could and maybes and should and woulds as I just did in this question. Speaker, it's absolutely clear that this is an arm's length investigation, arm's length from the government. No charges have been laid at this point. And Speaker, let me be absolutely clear that when it comes to any uh, elements of prosecution, this matter is being in the hands of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. It is not being done by the dealt by the Ministry of Attorney General. From day one of this investigation, we move this this entire process in the hands of the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, which is which is part of the Federal Ministry of Justice. This is arms length speaker. All the resources of the process and the system are always available. And I urge all the members, especially member like the member opposite who happens to be a lawyer, to respect the process and don't urge the government to interfere in the process. The member from Halton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. As recently as Tuesday, I have been reading newspaper articles and hearing public outcry regarding a recent Federal Court of Appeal decision that was handed down. My constituents in Halton, as well as myself, would like some clarification about the case. Mr. Speaker, I understand that the Federal Appeal Court ruled from the bench that the federal government's policy forcing face coverings such as niqabs to be removed while taking the Canadian citizenship oath violated the Citizenship Act. Mr. Speaker, the Act clearly states that candidates for citizenship must be allowed the greatest possible religious freedom when they take the oath. I had read that Ontario intervened, but was wondering if, through you, the Attorney General could provide some clarification on the case itself, as well as Ontario's Question. position on the matter. Thank you. Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Alton for this uh, very important question. As Attorney General in Ontario, I welcome the Federal Court of Appeal dismissal of the federal government's appeal over a ban on face coverings at citizenship ceremonies. A guiding principle, Mr. Speaker, of our government is to treat everyone with dignity and respect and to accommodate diverse identities as outlined under the Charter and the Human Rights Code in Ontario. It is imperative to ensure that this principle applies to all women in our province, regardless of their religious belief. That is why our government, the Government of Ontario, intervened before the Federal Court on Appeal, in this case, in support of Ms. Iskouash's position. For this reason above, if leave to appeal this yes, matter is granted by the Supreme Court of Canada, Ontario will intervene to defend the right and freedom we hold so dearly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Attorney General for her excellent answer. Now, one of the concerns I've heard from my constituents is that the federal government's insistence that women remove their face coverings for citizenship ceremonies isn't just an inappropriate position from the perspective of religious freedom. It's also inappropriate on a gender basis. The federal government's position discriminates against women. 
Mr. Speaker, can the minister please inform the House on the government's perspective regarding the gender bias inherent to the federal government's position and face coverings at citizenship ceremonies? Thank you. Minister uh, responsible for women issues. The minister responsible for women's issues. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thanks again to the member from Halton. This is a very important and serious question, and absolutely, this federal policy, which I'd like to note, has been struck down decisively by the courts twice, is inappropriate on so many levels and of special concern to me in the impact it has on women. We know that women's clothing choices have often come under unwarranted attention and judgment as a reflection of their character and trustworthiness. Whether it's niqab or a miniskirt, that is not okay. It's simply not okay to deny the dignity and autonomy of any woman to wear what she wants. In the Can I please have this referred to government policy? It's true when the result of not complying with a federal directive. So from an Ontario women's perspective, we're very concerned about this, and we support this woman as her case moves forward. Answer, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> question, member from Elgin, Minnesota. Thank you, Speaker. My, speak, my question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Minister, we all know the importance of community living associations throughout Ontario. Yep. They provide support and services for people with intellectual disabilities, Absolutely. their families and communities across the province. Unfortunately, your government downloaded the cost of pay equity to the local level. Premiers Ray, Premiers Harris, Premiers Eve supported pay equity funding, but the Wind government has not. Oh. Many community living associations are facing financial pressures in which they are unable to meet their pay equity obligation, which is resulting in the elimination of services and support in our communities. How can you expect the many community living associations in Ontario to meet their pay equity obligations and still maintain a viable organization that looks after some of the society's most vulnerable? Wow. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member uh, for the question. Certainly, the situation with community living Elgin is one that uh, I have uh, become very familiar with, and our ministry is working very closely with that organization uh, to ensure, first of all, the most important aspect of this uh, particular situation is that individuals continue to have access to services and supports that they require and that partners and staff in the sector are fully supported uh, in that work. Certainly the organization, which of course is an independent organization with its own board of directors, is a transfer payment agency of our government. Uh, they are expected by us to provide the services to the individuals and the families that require them, and we are monitoring the situation at Community Living Elgin extremely closely. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, I'm glad you mentioned my riding. Community Living Algon has announced it plans to eliminate 17 full-time positions, 64 staff cuts, as well as close the drop-in centre at the Talbot Teen Centre, eliminate the day support programming at 2 Curtis Street, and shut down a group home on East Street. And this is based on a plan approved by your ministry. These cuts are reality because in the past, in part because of a deficit caused by the unfunded pay equity in excess of $300,000. But, Minister, my riding is not alone. And as other community living associations across the province are facing the same situation. Yeah. Yeah. Minister, are you going to correct your financial mismanagement by punishing those most vulnerable? Uh, my, Mr. Speaker, uh, my ministry is monitoring the situation at Community Living Elgin extremely closely. In fact, we're conducting a financial review of that particular organization, and this will take a number of weeks to complete that review. Uh, I want to assure everyone that, in fact, Community Living Elgin has received increasing funds from our government. Uh, they are changing some of their service provision to, in fact, include uh, uh, programs where workers are uh, ensuring that there are wraparound services around individuals so that they can, in fact, be more included in the local community. And uh, this is all being monitored very closely to ensure that uh, concerned families and uh, individuals Answer. are satisfied with the type of service services that uh, are being provided, and we will continue to monitor the situation closely.
Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Parents and students deserve stability in our schools, but for more than a year, this Liberal government has failed to reach new collective agreements that protect the quality of publicly funded education and respect all of our teachers and education workers. 382 days after the last contracts expired, this Premier has no excuse, no excuse for not being at the table and working as hard as she can to reach tentative agreements with elementary teachers and education workers. Will the Acting Premier do what the Premier has failed to do all week and send the Education Minister back to the bargaining table today? Well, Speaker, for a fleeting moment, just a fleeting moment, I thought maybe the member opposite would stand up and say, I'm really pleased to see that a tentative agreement has been reached with the third teachers' uh, union, AEFO. Speaker. I am very proud that we now have ESPO, OSSTF, and now AEFO have signed tentative agreements, Speaker, and are in the process of ratification. That is very good news for the students of Ontario, Speaker, and their parents. Ontario students deserve the very best education. In fact, we are proud that we have one of the finest education systems in the world, Speaker, and we want to maintain that. When it comes to negotiations with ETFO, the member opposite knows that in May, ETFO decided that it did not want to negotiate. It walked away from the table in May. Finally, we're able to come back on September the 1st. We are, we are very interested in reaching a settlement with them, Speaker, and we will continue to work uh, when they are ready to come back. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd be happy to see the government back at the table with ETFO and all education. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier. The Premier and Education Minister have had over a year to negotiate new agreements with all of our dedicated education workers and teachers. They have failed to deliver the stability that parents and students deserve. Now the Premier thinks she can short-circuit real bargaining by trying to impose a deal and then walking away from the table. Speaker, that's not how it's done. But once again, we see that the Premier is more interested in helping the federal Liberal campaign than she is in negotiating agreements that restore stability in our classrooms. How can the acting Premier defend this Liberal government's failure to get back to the bargaining table, get back to real negotiations, and reach agreements with all Question. of our teachers and education workers? Thank you. Thank you, Sir, you know, I, I can uh, assure the member opposite that we've been working very hard to reach that agreement. Uh, we did table a comprehensive uh, uh, approach, Speaker. We are waiting for them to respond to that approach. I can assure you that when they are ready to respond to that, we will be at the table in a nanosecond, Speaker. We want kids to be in a good learning environment. We want teachers to be free of the stress that comes with labour uncertainty, Speaker. We are very motivated. This has nothing to do from our side with the federal government, but, Speaker, we are working with QP. We are working with other educational workers. We want that peace and stability in our classroom, and I am Order. delighted that we have had success with OECDA, with OSSTF, and now o AEFO, Speaker. Answer. Thank you. New question. The member Scarborough. Agent Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. This summer, I was thrilled to be one of millions of Ontarians to be caught up in the Pan Am fever. It was hard to miss, Mr. Speaker. There was something for everyone, thrilling athletic competitions, amazing musical performances and cultural experiences from across the Pan American countries. Whether it was through the torch relays that touch 130 communities in Ontario or a celebration that were held during the Games. Across the province, Ontarians were cheering the athletes. Furthermore, thousands of enthusiastic volunteers like Scarborough Asian Corps youth, Cindy Yu and Lena Lee, who made the Games possible. They supported the athletes and were cheering their achievements throughout the Games. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please inform the House about how the people from the province, the countries and the world participate in the Pan Am and Parapan Am Games this summer? Minister, President, Sport, Responsible Pan Am, Parapan Games. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court uh, for her question, but also for uh, her support for the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. Oh, I know that uh, she's absolutely right. Ontarians love the Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games. Mr. Speaker, there was a lot of hard work put into it, and uh, there, it took a lot of hard work from uh, people throughout our ministry and our partners across Ontario, but also uh, several members in this House. I know Minister Nackvi was responsible uh, for coordinating a, a strong security plan, it was very successful. Minister Del Duca uh, kept the region moving, and I'm very thankful for his work. Uh, Minister uh, Duguid uh, looked at uh, infrastructure and were able to, uh, to come $56 million under budget with our infrastructure. And of course, um, the Premier, who is a strong advocate for sports and athleticism here in the province of Ontario. But there were also members uh, uh, and opposite that showed up to support our athletes, and I want to support the members in the opposition who showed up uh, for supporting our athletes because it was very important for the success of the Games. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you to the Minister. I know that our government bid on these games not only for the incredible excitement that occurred during the games, but also provide a legacy that would benefit our province for generations to come. In Scarborough, we are fortunate to have a brand new state of our art aquatic center to provide much community recreation space for university students and the Scarborough community. The facility is expected to serve 1,000 to 1,500 students per day from the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. This facility will provide lasting legacy not only for the high performance athletes, but also students, uh, support groups, uh, community residents of all ages and abilities. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please inform the House about the legacy left behind by the Pan Am and the Para Pan Am Games? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the member is right. There were a lot of new facilities built and some retrofits with our existing uh, facilities that were here in Ontario. And if you look around uh, the GTA and across uh, many parts of the province, these facilities uh, bring in a, a renewed sense of uh, inspiration to our, our athletes and our uh, people involved in, uh, in amateur sport across Ontario. When you go out to Milton and look at the velodrome, it's just transformed that landscape. Uh, the members write about Scarborough, the Aquatic Centre, it's uh, transformative. And we have we built into the plan, Mr. Speaker, over 90,000 hours of community use uh, for people wow. to get into those buildings and use uh, use those uh, those facilities. But in addition to that, Mr. Speaker, during the Pan Am Games, I was proud to see that spending was up. In fact, we had an 8% increase in electronic uh, debit uh, transactions during the same time from the previous year, and hotels were sold out. It was such a success, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank everyone involved for being part of that success. Thank you. No question. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the, the decision to sell Hydro One was made behind closed doors by the banker that the Premier brought in to be the training wheels for the Finance Minister. There was no public consultation. I just want to share with you uh, comments from one Ontarian. The government has no mandate to sell off the grid, and there has been no public consultation or debate about such a sale. He went on to say selling the crown jewel of our electricity system was a very serious mistake. That was said in the legislature, not by me or the opposition leader. It was said by former Liberal Cabinet Minister Sean Conway. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, members of the Liberal Party have raged against selling Hydro One in the past. Now they're perfectly okay with selling it off to their buddies on Bay Street. Liberals sitting in the cabinet opposed the fire sale of Hydro One. Mr. Speaker, how did they feel about Ed Clark having more say than they do? Good question. Well, uh, Speaker, uh, given that the member opposite is interested in some quotes from uh, uh, from days gone by, I've got some for you too. Um, so I've got some quotes from the minister, the member from Simcoe Gray, Speaker, who said, uh, "Let's just listen to what he said." The government announced on December 12, 2001, that it has decided to privatize Hydro One. We believe this decision best serves the interests of Ontario taxpayers and electricity customers. The member from Simcoe Gray, he'll remember that. He also said, over the long term, we believe that the restructuring of the electricity system in Ontario will impose sufficient market discipline. But that's not enough. There's more, Speaker. There's more. On January 24, 2002, he said, 
We believe this decision best serves the interests of Ontario taxpayers and electricity customers. Some people mistakenly refer to electricity competition as deregulation. Thank you. It is not. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, I've got to warn the Liberals that the fire sale of Hydro One is spreading. And let's continue the theme here of Throwback Thursdays. I've got another quote from someone from Eastern Ontario who said, quote, Ontario families want affordable, reliable electricity. They know the sale of the grid that carries electricity to their homes is a disaster for consumers. He then went on to warn that selling Hydro One was a reward for corporate friends and that people want the sale stopped. You know who said that, Mr. Speaker? That was their former Premier, Dalton McGuinty, who said that. Premier. Even the former Premier, no stranger to handing government contracts to their Liberal pals, knew that Hydro One was just going to be a bottomless trough for well-connected insiders. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier stop the Hydro One sale, or is she eager to do exactly what Dalton McGuinty warned and stuff her friend's pockets? I don't accept drive-by heckling. <laughs> On a serious note, I would advise the member to be very cautious of the type of language he used in his last sentence. I really do need to point out that uh, when the PCs were in power and they were busy selling off Highway 407, you'll remember that, I suspect. And well, the member of um, uh, uh, Pembroke doesn't want to doesn't want to be reminded selling off Highway 407, a fire sale price, no ongoing revenue, actually was helpful to us as we designed a program that maintains a uh, uh, de facto control speaker in the for the uh, people of Ontario. Your plan was to sell 100 per cent of hydro. Make no mistake about it. You wanted to sell it all together. You wanted no oversight, Speaker. We are broadening the ownership. We are generating some assets so we can invest in other assets, Speaker. This is an important initiative to undertake because the people right across this province, whether they're in big cities or small towns, rural areas, medium-sized cities, they are all asking for investments Answer. in infrastructure. The only way we can do that Speaker, is by using leveraging existing assets so we can build new Thank ones. Thank you. Your question, Member for Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Agriculture. Farmers across Ontario become very frustrated with the government's seemingly unwillingness to develop regulations regarding neonic treated seed that actually work on the ground. The first sign was when they held the EBR consultations in the middle of planting season when farmers had no time to talk about the regulations, and things haven't gone any better. And one screaming example, Speaker, is you need a certified crop advisor to um, approve your needs assessment for an ENIC-C. We agree with that. Farmers agree with that. But the crop advisor can't be affiliated with any company that sells seed. So the majority of crop advisors are now out of the game, people that farmers have trusted for years. Does the minister actually believe that these people aren't competent or independent? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Agriculture. Well, thanks uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Through you to my friend uh, from Tabisca Bay Market, I want to uh, thank him for his uh, question this morning. As we do know, there is a, a legal case that is pending on the regulations, and I can't comment on that. But basically, basically, but basically, Mr. Speaker. We've, uh, we've identified four contributing factors uh, to pollinator health in the province of Ontario. Uh, number one, there was two severe winters that have caused an impact on pollinator health. Two, the fact is that there's a number of hives in Ontario that have been invaded uh, by the varroa mite. Three, there's the management issue of the hives between professional managers and hobbyists. And four, the blanket use of neonics across the province of Ontario. The bottom line, Mr. Speaker, is if you need to use neonics in the province of Ontario, if you have demonstrated need, answer. you can get access to them, Mr. Speaker, to our farmers in Ontario. Good answer. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, once again, the minister asked a specific question and didn't get an answer, so I'm going to rephrase it. In, I'm a farmer. I've used the same certified crop consultant for 20 years, Terry Phillips from the Temiskaming Ag Co-op. 
I've trusted him. He's told me at times, you know, John, you shouldn't spray because it's too late or it's not effective or maybe you should rotate more. He's given me good advice. But Terry Phillips, according to the government, is not qualified to give me advice on neonics. That's ridiculous. And I'm glad I'm a farmer be able to say that, and the minister should take heed that a crop advisor is a crop advisor. They're certified, and if they're not certified, tell me why you don't believe in their certification. Thank you. Uh, the member from Dufferin Caledon come to order. Question. I want, to John, thank the, I want to thank the member for his supplementary question because I just found out something this morning. Uh -oh. The member from the Mr. Bank Frankfurt. The members from to Mr. McCracken had this to say on May 7th to the Chatham Daily News. As a party, we believe there is room for more regulation. I've used Neodex on my farm. They're very effective, but perhaps, Mr. Speaker, they were overused. Do we believe there should be stronger regulations, Mr. Speaker? He said yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? The member from Newmarket Aurora. The question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister, I know your ministry has been very involved in our government's efforts to spur innovation in this province and sharpen our competitive advantage in the global marketplace. One way we've done this is through creating an innovation hub at Mars, a hub that works to equip innovators and organizations with entrepreneurial skills required to compete in the 21st century. Thank you. Carry on, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying, Mars has been a critical component for fledgling private sector startups and health sciences researchers. Despite this important mandate, I understand Mars has had troubles in the past with respect to its lease-up situation. Minister, does the project still pose challenges? Question. Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Speaker, Infrastructure. I'm very thrilled this morning to be able to say to you, Mr. Speaker, uh, that we really have turned the page on Mars. This has been a challenging year, and it's great to see that happening. When the financing of the West Tower ran into difficulties associated with the global recession, many said that this province should walk away. Mr. Speaker, we didn't. We consulted real estate experts Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson. We got some good advice, and just as importantly, we had the courage to take that advice. It was unfettered advice, Mr. Speaker. It was good advice. Last December, when we announced that our government was stepping up to put Mars on solid footing, we had the full confidence, Mr. Speaker, that that, that West Tower would be a success. Today, I can now confirm that Mars has attracted a really interesting and effective mix of innovative tenants that will drive research, yes, innovation and commercialization. It's now 70 per cent leased, well on the way to be fully leased. Mr. Speaker, this is a success. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Minister, for that, uh, that exciting update. And I know that, uh, that this project is something that is very important to not only uh, residents in my riding of Newmarket Aurora, but of course to, uh, to residents and business people across the province. It's, it's exciting, and I'm so glad to hear that uh, the minister uh, stuck to his guns. Minister, recently the government announced that a new innovative tenant was joining the ranks at Mars and was setting up their Canadian headquarters here. This is surely an important milestone for a significant project such as Mars. JLab is a major research and development engine that assists health and biosciences companies transform science research into breakthrough healthcare products. The members opposite have been criticizing Question. this project at every step, Mr. Speaker, but now it seems that the building is leasing up on time and that things are moving forward smoothly. Thank you. Can the minister speak? Um, 
before we stop, uh, before we uh, finish again, a, another reminder for all members: let's stay focused on how we present the question in the third person to the chair. Mr. Speaker, our government is very pleased that Jay Labs has agreed to establish its largest research innovation life science incubator here in Ontario. There's no question, Mr. Speaker, that Jay Labs is a coup for this province's bioscience sector. The competition was stiff from other jurisdictions, and we won that business, Mr. Speaker, because we stepped up with investments that helped ensure that that investment came here instead of other places in North America, and because also of the availability of the Mars West Tower. J Labs ended up at Mars, but we were pursuing them regardless of wherever they wanted to go in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. They chose Mars because it was the perfect location for them. The members opposite urged us to walk away and leave that building rotting in the ground, Mr. Speaker. Instead, we stepped up, and the result is the Answer. attraction of companies like J Labs that are proven innovation engines that are going to drive our bioscience sector forward Thank here you. in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your question, the member from uh, Halton and Norfolk. Uh, speaker, to the Minister of Transportation, we're approaching one year since construction has been shut down on the Cuga Bridge on Provincial Highway No. 3 because of intimidation. The Minister's letter of August 14 said construction was paused due to a request from the Hidatasi Development Institute, or HDI, out of Six Nations. Well, they walked out on the bridge and the construction workers left. The temporary bridge is a problem for farm machinery, for large trucks. It's an eyesore. I regularly receive calls from Cuga wanting to know when the new bridge will be completed. The original was built in 1924. When will construction workers be allowed back on the bridge? The Minister of Transportation's letter in August noted a date for resumption of work has not been scheduled. Can he now tell this House if a date Question. for startup has been set? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much, Speaker. I, I thank the member opposite for this question. I know he's raised this uh, particular issue in the legislature uh, in the past, and some of, uh, some of my colleagues on this side have had the chance to answer as well. Of course, the Ministry of Transportation is keen to see progress on this particular issue. We know it's important uh, to this particular part of the province. We are in consultation on a regular basis, not only with uh, our partners and stakeholders in the community, but also the Ministry of Aboriginal Affairs to make sure that we are successfully fulfilling our responsibilities with respect to the duty to, the duty to consult. We will continue, Speaker, to endeavour to uh, reach a resolution on this very important matter. Uh, I have no concern whatsoever, of course, Speaker, uh, with respect to uh, keeping this particular member, should he have additional questions offline outside of the chamber itself, uh, to uh, keep him in the loop, as they say, uh, with respect to what's happening in this particular part of the province. And, Speaker, as soon as the ministry can provide a comprehensive uh, answer by yes, way of a specific update, I'll be happy to provide that information. Thanks very much, Speaker. Time, time expired. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recess until. Oh, sorry, excuse me. I'm sorry, I did. I see a point of order. Point of order, the member from Burlington. A point of order to introduce some late arriving guests. Speaker, on behalf of the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and his legislative assistant, Corey Preston, I'd like to welcome Corey's parents, Ron and Kathy Preston, to the legislature today. They've come all the way here from Wallstown, Ontario, to join us. We're pleased to have you here. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. The Minister of Health and Food Care. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was remiss in not introducing the family of our page captain today, our page captain being Jalila Amar, and she's here with her parents, Marie Kamal and brother Hassan, in the gallery. Being no further uh, points of orders, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.